So again, um, I can't make anybody a lawyer in, in half an hour, but I am going to talk a lot about the things that I have seen in you know the last couple of weeks, the questions that I've gotten, some of the ridiculous stories I've heard, um, and also get into, again, I can't make you a lawyer in half an hour, but I, I'm gonna talk about a, a lot of key issues within contracts so that you have red flags that you can either know how to you know maneuver within or know when to ask for help um, and then we're going to switch over to helen and let her talk about uh, pivoting your strategy from one of crisis reaction into one where you're focused on opportunities and that strategy that you had originally planned um, all right and i'm just going to skip over that so so if we make the assumption that some people on the call had contracts and now their contracts don't make sense for oh you know whatever reason like we're all locked in our houses and scared of a virus um you know maybe you can't produce what you're supposed to be producing or you can't supply the services that you're supposed to be supplying or you can't buy the things that you're supposed to be buying um whatever the reason is there's a lot of people breaking contracts right now and so like i said i'm going to go through a lot of um, high level issues. I'm gonna focus on the ones, not necessarily that cause the most consternation, but the ones that are causing the most problems today in this environment. Um, one of the key things that I wanna mention though, and it's a little bit too late, but to fix, it's a little bit too late to fix, but it's nice to know when to stop arguing. Um, if you up to this point were lazy in your contract, please know that judges know that and that attorneys know that. And if you are lazy in your contracting, judges are gonna be lazy in helping. And so this is the reason why attorneys write all those clauses in your itty bitty simple contract. Uh, and you know, if you, I, I've had a, over the years, I've had a, a handful of people tell me, well, I only want a three page contract. And that's really extremely arbitrary because it's, the length, um, the number of pages shouldn't really matter so much as what the document says. And you know, I always try to give my clients what they want, but it's always my job to also talk about what they're what they're leaving out. And a whole lot of people left out things that would have kept them safe in the in these times. So again, I, I just sort of mentioned that in the if that was one of the things that you decided either not to pitch to the other side of your contract or to cut out, or you just didn't understand it, so you deleted it. Um, whatever it is, you may not get so get recourse in, in the in this time of this pandemic. So, the other sort of overlaying concept here is that I know every contract. There's always a contract that says, and this contract is not. You you can't amend it. Nobody can amend anything. But the thing is, if both sides agree to amend it, then you can amend that part that said you couldn't amend it. Um, and so if you're a great negotiator and you have a good rapport with the other side of your contract, um, I, you know, everything else I'm gonna say should be put aside and you should renegotiate your contract and paper it up and write about it and both parties should sign it. But, you know, again, I can go through these nitty gritty, but some of the nitty gritty that I'm gonna go to is of course, thinking down the road towards getting attorneys involved and getting litigation involved. And um, if you can cut all of that short by just having a great relationship and great negotiation skills with the other side, you should always do that first. Um, but in your arguments doing some of that, let's talk about some of those words. Um, there, you know, the force majeure is that a lot of this stuff is coming under and sometimes contracts won't use the term force majeure they'll either say acts of god or even some say acts of man and um, some have provisions for acts of god and acts of man and they're, they're held separately one of the things that is important about the the act of god or the force majeure is that that thing that is making you not able to do your contract has to be the only thing going on if you are going to use your force majeure clause. So the economy generally sucking can't be, that's too vague, it's too big, it's too generous. And it probably needs to be um, the virus was in Austin and our mayor made us stay at home and therefore I cannot do my juggling contract for you in your home this week. Um, that's you know really, really specific. It's the only cause. Um, if it's that, well, I can't make these tennis shoes anymore because the economy went 
went in the tank. And so people are shifting their, their money from shoes over to household goods. But that, you know, that general shift in the economy probably is too vague and too indirect to use a force majeure clause, which doesn't mean there's not another clause in your contract to keep you safe. I don't know. Um, but it d might mean that you can't use your force majeure clause. Um, other things to keep importance or keep it top of mind rather, um, a lot of contracts say things like, uh, you know, if the economy tanks or Bob slips on a banana or Jill falls in the pool, then we don't have to perform. And there'll be, a, or, you know, and it'll be this really specific list. And, and then sometimes it'll say, if Bob slips on a banana and Jill falls in the pool or anybody else from the family has anything bad happen, then we don't have to perform. And those are called catch-alls. And, it, you know, a lot of contracts, it's it can be both a way to be lazy, but you know, you can also be very intentional and deliberate and having a catch all that says something like, uh, you know, and, and, and any other thing along these lines, but that catch all has to be something foreseeable. And so if you're looking at your contract and you're thinking, oh, it says, or any other reason that I can't perform this contract, it had to have been something foreseeable. And since there's general consensus that nobody foresaw that this was going to happen to us this spring, it's very unlikely that your catch-all clause is going to get you out of a contract performance. The, another, another thing that, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, but um, if, you know, you're gonna, look to the clauses of your contract to get out of performing or getting out of having to perform um, a part of your contract, it, 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 the market fluctuations are probably not going to get you there. So just generally speaking, um, unless you've got some really specific and, and juicy great terms, just saying, you know, people just aren't spending money anymore, aren't going to get you there. But there are other things that might. Um, and the next couple of things are also a little bit of some of those, those trickster words that attorneys like to use, I guess. Um, the, one of them is frustration of purpose. And so frustration of purpose is a, a legal concept that says, you know, I never would have done this if I had known that the outcome would be X. And the other party says, I never would have bought this if I knew the outcome would be X. And both parties have a frustration of their purpose for entering into the contract. And in that case, you can probably say that your contract is null. Um, you can, again, you can both agree to that, but um, if you want to, you know, ha have to fight about it, you have to get attorneys involved and where to go as far as litigation, please know that it's both sides that have to have the fr frustration of purpose. If, um, if my, my contract is to sell you a boat tour, and the ocean dries up, then I am, I am, my, my purpose has been frustrated because I can't give you a tour of the ocean if there's no ocean. And the person buying that tour is going to say, well, I was buying a tour to see the ocean and it doesn't exist anymore, it dried up. And so both parties have a frustration of their purpose. And since both parties, nobody's one-upping the other or getting a gotcha on that. Um, frustration of purpose is a, a philosophy that would nullify a contract and let you get out of it. And unforeseeable is another term of art that comes into a lot of contracts as a reason you can get out of contracts. Um, the unforeseeability must have been foreseeable when the, the contract was authored. So we haven't had a virus like this since the plague. Um, so not in our lifetime, not in the reasonable business cycle that we're dealing with right now. And so if you were to go to a judge and say, oh, it says if unforeseeable things happened, um, and, this unforese and this was unforeseeable, they're going to say, no, 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 that's not what that's talking about. That's talking about within the contract um, arena that you're working in, um, something that, that everybody knew was a possibility, but they had worked around it and made sure it was never going to really come to fruition, not something that was so far-fetched it never even um, never even came into mind. That, that wasn't even something people were contracting around. And, and basically, the, my takeaway from all these sort of gotcha words are, are that it's generally a very, very high standard on all of those sort of gotcha phrases. And most of the rest of your contract is going to be interpreted by normal people's English. And so unless you have one of those like frustration of purpose or, um, you, you know, unforeseeability or, you know, the, the force majeure stuff, 
those things have some really precise and maybe slightly awkward uh, interpretations, but the rest of it is just plain old English. And so as you do negotiate with your parties, please always know that most of what you're dealing with is also the way you talk to your friends and the way you make agreements with your family. Those are, those are the way those terms would be interpreted by a judge too. Um, a couple other just sort of real quick things to, to contemplate. If you don't have a contract, but your, your agreement with somebody is about the sale of goods and there's nothing written down in an agreement, your transaction is going to be governed by the UCC and that's an international code and we have adopted it in the United States and then modified it in Texas slightly. Um, but again, this is for parties who either have portions of a contract not written down or so ambiguous it can't be interpreted or no contract written and it's for the sale of goods. So service providers like me as a lawyer, the UCC will never help me at all. Um, it's only for the sale of goods. But so if you find yourself in this position and you're dealing goods, look to the, you know, the UCC to help you interpret things. And other quick, quick note, both in terms of your contracts that you might be having trouble with and in terms of insurance, which I will not get into too much, um, but if you ever think you're going to claim something on insurance, please remember that probably, probably in your contracts and always in your insurance policies, you are required to give notice very, very quickly. So all this, uh, this, this Texas sense of we can fix it on our own and this robust sense of being able to to solve or you get off the phone with either your insurance company or you said notice that you know you're required to do under a contract so do that quickly um, and a lot of businesses might have business interruption insurance and so check around to see if you have that um, okay one of the other things I wanted to, to talk about real quickly is when you need a lawyer um, you need a lawyer when you talk about any of those, those gotcha phrases that I just went through, but to get a lawyer is when the dollars are going to sink you, or you notice that people in your leadership team and you know probably the negotiation leadership team are getting too emotionally invested in this. And what I will say to you is that any attorney's fees are going to be cheap in comparison to what happens when emotionally charged parties start negotiating. Um, it, it just doesn't go well cheaper than therapists after the fact just go ahead and lawyer up if you're realizing that you that you're too emotionally invested i mean lawyers do this too i was in a car accident and i thought you know I, I know how to do this i've done this before i've been through this before and i've helped friends go through this and at some point i realized i i couldn't because i was making bad decisions it was causing me to think about it all the time it was just causing me to make more bad decisions so if you've got people that are emotionally invested um go ahead and lawyer up and uh, you probably probably need a transactional attorney and that's what you should be searching for when you're looking for an attorney um, somebody who probably has mediation experience and preferably somebody who either has in-house or has good associations with a litigator um, so you know don't hire your family law attorney to negotiate your semiconductor conduct you know go ahead and get a transactional person get, get somebody that does have those connections in the litigation all right, so the next slide I'm going to talk about where are we on time? is the FFCRA. And this is the new law um, that came down and said, all you small businesses, you suddenly have to follow all the rules that all the big companies always had to follow. Hope you saved for that because we never knew it was coming. Um, and so it's kind of to a lot of small businesses like my own. Um, there was talk that there was going to be an exemption for micro businesses under 50, and that didn't come out the way that anybody thought it would. So what that exemption ended up saying is that it's not by the business. So it's not if you're under 50, then you just don't have to follow this anymore. It's if you are under 50 people in your company and these things apply to the employee that wants to have leave. So you have to do this analysis for each person that needs leave. So the employee has specialized skills, so they are the only one that knows how to make your fancy kind of hat. Or they're the only person that knows how to put um, the curls on your wigs. You know, whatever that highly specialized thing is, it could be because credentialing, it could be 
because they've done this for 50 years, whatever that is, but it has to be specialized. That person has to earn more money than your company has, which is hopefully not the position anybody finds themselves in, but is a very high standard. And also that person has to have kids who are in a school that are canceled. So everyone without kids, sorry, it's a weird form of discrimination that we've never seen before. Now all the people without kids are discriminated against for the first time. Um, so again, the micro business exemption is by the employee, but it has to be in a business under 50, with, uh, the employee has to have specialized skills and they, that person has to make more than the company. The rest of what this bill does neatly falls into constructs that we're slightly aware of in other arenas. But as soon as you start thinking that the analysis is the same, you're gonna screw it up. So I actually worked with a graphics designer and I made this chart, which is available on my website. And I have a link up here, sorry, it's gone, but it's at lynchlf.com. Um, and if you go to resources, I'm gonna encourage you to always go there. The Chamber also has it on their coronavirus response page. And again, I'm gonna encourage you to always go to the link rather than just downloading it and using it because things are changing so fast. And I've been, I, I think I've probably, you know, updated this five times already. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through a super quick, super quick analysis of how to handle this because it is so different than what we've done before with small businesses. So if somebody is sick, they can get up to $511 per day for being sick if they are required to stay home according to a court order, which we are um, an order by a government, it doesn't have to be a court, but by a government, um, which we all are right now, um, or because a doctor said that, that person has to stay home, like you know, if you're immune compromised or you actually have the virus, um, and, or you've had a doctor sign the note and you can only have up to 80 hours and it has to be within two weeks. So if I am an employee who only works 30 hours a week on average, I will never get the 80 hours because I can only earn it within two weeks. I can get 60 hours because it, I can do that um, in two weeks, but it's up to 80 hours and it's only for two weeks. So conversely, if I normally work 80 hours per week, I'm only gonna get paid for my sick leave for the first week. But um, that has never applied to small businesses before, and it does now. You can still do that micro business analysis, but again, it's super hard. So that's for two weeks. And then we have this mini small company FMLA, and that's for 10 weeks. The first two weeks are unpaid, but they can be paid by your sick leave or some other vacation or some other leave that people have. So this is like normal FMLA, right? So it's either unpaid or I get to use some other pay for the first two weeks. And then FMLA is pay, the, the small business FMLA is paid out at two thirds the rate of your normal pay. There is a max and it's for someone who is caring for someone with sick symptoms, caring for someone with a doctor's order to stay home, caring for kids without school, or has the symptoms of coronavirus but does not have a doctor's note yet. Um, that is the, the, the general new family law thing we got. Um, just real quickly, there's a whole lot of loans going around right now, and a lot of them will, well, I probably won't make up for all of this time that we are being required to pay out to people, um, but it will, it will cover and pay for a lot of it. So uh, the, the thing that I would want people to take away though, is that you need to get your application in now. Like seriously, if you're counting on that money, you should probably drop off this call and go turn in your application. I should have had it in yesterday. You gotta get it in today. Everybody's saying money dries up by midnight probably. Um, but that's the foreseeable, um, the foreseeable expectation is that all of that money will be dried up. So even if your application's not perfect, get it turned in. Okay, I'm going to transition real quickly to managing employees who work from home. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, we have what we always did, our standards, which hopefully we've written down into a handbook, um, your cultural norms, which is how we actually behave, uh, you know, and, and other things that we do. And then we threw a virus at that and everything went crazy and we sent everyone home. And so how do we interpret what we used to do and to what we have to do today? And 
I hope we start with what we used to do. So if you had a rule like, you know, you've got to pick up the phone after the third ring, that's really easily transferable. And every time you have a rule like that, let's keep using it. Hopefully some of your dress codes also stay the same. That, but, you know, with relation to dress codes, that's also a really good opportunity to have grace here. Um, because the other thing that I will tell you as an employment attorney is that I'm not the cheapest person in the world to deal with. And so if there is something you can do to be reasonable with your workforce right now, when we know that anxieties are high and there's peer reviewed statistical information indicating that anxiety is contagious, and you can help manage that anxiety among your team, either by having dress up days or super casual till this is over days or, you know, whatever else it is, you know, why not? Why not go for that? But you don't have to. And so if you have a salespeople and client facing people, you know, go ahead and say you still have to dress up. Um, I am having some, some companies, they are having to adjust their their dress code a bit um, in particular uh, v-necks and scoop neck shirts don't always show up well on zoom because as you bend over to talk to the camera it looks a little bit different than how we encounter each other in an office space i um, mean so in some cases it, it may you know you might have to amend some things you know you can go ahead and throw your perfume roll out the door people can wear as much perfume as they want while they're at home because nobody can smell each other um, one really super important thing that i do want to say though if you have an employee and that you suspect, even suspect that that person is experiencing domestic violence, it just, just call me. Just say, Natalie said to call you and the receptionist will put you through and I'll call you, or I'll call you back. Um, it is conceivable that if you as an employer knew that one of your employees was at risk for, um, for experiencing domestic violence while in your workplace, which is now their house, um, you could be liable for that. Is it? It, you know, there's a ton of resources. There's people at the chamber who are really good at connecting everybody with the best resources available, um, Stephanie in particular. Um, but, you know, this is a thing that actually can come back to the employer and always could, except now we're asking people to stay at home with their, with their uh, abuser. So anyway, call me. We can talk about that later. We'll talk about it discreetly and we'll get that person help. But um, other things about staying at home. You know, if people are sick, the rules still work, the, the labor rules still work. So if they work an hour and they're hourly, they need to be paid. If they work an hour and their salary, they have to be paid the whole day. Um, and so, so those weird labor rules that we had, they always still apply. Also, as you adjust your labor to moving to home, please remember that we do have labor laws. So I had a client that, um, they were like, well, you know, I got this guy and he's 71 years old and he just runs errands for us. And so I'm just going to give him $500 a week. And I really don't have it, but he's not going to be doing anything. I just can't take his salary away. And he's in that age bracket. So I don't want him coming to work. I was like, that, that is lovely. And that comes from a beautiful, beautiful place in your heart. However, you're probably violating labor laws. So, you, you know, think about it, think through it, talk to people, look at the TWC's web, uh, website with regards to how you can pay people hourly or salaried and what you do if they do get sick and what you do um, if you adjust these things. I will say you should paper this stuff up too um, so that you can prove a lot of this. Um, and the best way that I want to make a couple of points on to make some adjustments to the way, you know, handbooks and dress codes, things like that. You can roll out, you can adjust and roll out company wide. Um, but other people may need different adjustments either because they've got the balancing school or balancing a grandma or balancing, um, there's only one office space for two spouses to work in or, you know, whatever it is, we're, we're all balancing things right now. Um, but so you might need to change people's accommodations person by person in a lot of ways and you should do that in a temporary uh, position job description which also means you should have a job description for every person but that was always something you should have had um, and this is a great time to work on it because you can sit at home and be thoughtful about it and because if you don't have that you can get in so many trouble so much trouble in so many ways it's the first thing the TWC wants it's the first thing the EOC wants the first thing any attorney wants for anything they do. So if you don't have job descriptions for people, maybe write one um, and then say, these are the parts that are temporary until we go back to work um, in the office. 
And I, oh, one last thing, sorry. Um, trade secrets and privacy issues need to be considered. So much like if you are lazy in your contracting, a judge is going to be lazy in protecting you. If you are lazy in your protection of your trade secrets, a judge is going to be lazy in protecting you from your own mistakes. And what that means always is that nobody should ever have access to things that they don't need to perform their job. That should always be the rule. But now that we've taken computers home and opened networks and allowed people in, just go through that thought process of double checking that people still can't get to stuff they don't need for their particular jobs. Because that's the analysis that a judge or a court or an opposing party is going to do when they say whether or not that thing that got stolen was in fact a trade secret. Um, and think about how much you need to be protecting stuff and whose computer that stuff is getting put on. Is it yours or is it the employee's? Do you have a way for grabbing it back? Are you backing things up even though they're off site now? Um, so all of those things um, still need to be considered. They always did, but it's going to be a lot more important now. Um, and I, with that, am going to transition over to Helen. Am I unmuted? You are. Okay, good. Thank you. For a minute there, I forgot to do that. So in this next section, we're going to talk a little bit about pivoting your strategy. Um, you've taken time to develop one, we hope, and now, by golly, things are different. So we're going to talk about how to make the best out of this. Let's make some lemonade if we can. Um, we're going to talk about a, a little bit about the pivot, the origin of the pivot strategy. It's not really a new idea. Uh, we'll introduce the basics. Um, discuss elements of successful pivots, and then ways to look at new opportunities. Next slide. Natalie? Yeah. You're in charge of the slides, dear. Thank you. There we are. Uh, so <clears throat> the pivot strategy was coined uh, by Eric Ries in 2011 in his book, the, the Lean Startup. It's a really good book. Um, it's really geared towards entrepreneurs, and so if, you, if that's something that you're interested in, um, it's, a, it's a good book to have. He noted in his book that a company rarely creates an unchanging, successful strategy from the outset. That's not a big surprise. Rather, a company may go through a series of course corrections before finally emerging with a successful long-term strategy. Um, Reese defines the pivot as making a change in strategy without making a change in vision. Think of it as a change in the avenue a company uses or on the avenue they take to reach its goal. Um, if your goal is to go to Nordstrom's and do some shopping, there are various routes to get there, hopefully, someday, maybe. Um, but you get the idea. A genuine pivot as opposed to an all-out reverse direction in company vision can bring fresh perspective, uh, prevent stagnation, or respond to a crisis like we're going through now. <clears throat> Excuse me. The details of how, to, of how a strategy pivot looks will vary based on the company and based on the industry. So they're not, no two are really exactly the same. Next slide. So understanding the basics of the pivot is crucial before making rash decisions. Basic number one, data are your friends. And business owners must continually evaluate their data and respond to what their data reveal. Your data should tell you something about where you've been as a company and how well your product or service fares in the marketplace. Um, the data should tell you something about your customers, who they are, who they are not, what they like, what they don't like, what their loyalty motivations are. Data also can reveal the success or failure of your marketing strategy and point to where you need to go as a company. Basic number two, when to pivot. There are two main indicators for when to pivot your strategy, an internal and external. I think most of us are concerned about a particular external factor at the moment. Uh, even so, you may have 
been experiencing one or more of these internal factors before our current crisis. So it's use useful information to have, uh, especially as things return to normal and you start thinking about what to do next. Um, internal factors are those things that deal with the inner workings of the company, as the name implies. Uh, this includes staff turnover, uh, lethargy, and uh, lack of performance. Staff turnover, companies expect the occasional staffing change, but it rarely results in large-scale disruption uh, of, of the business. However, large groups of people leaving a company all at the same time points to a definite problem and may be an indicator for a need to pivot your strategy. Losing your key people in a brief period, same thing. Lethargy can be seen in the overall company climate as well as among the staff when the overall attitude is one of disinterest and neglect, obviously there is a problem. Other indicators of lethargy include when processes unexpectedly begin to require twice as much effort and time to reach previously met goals, when the addition of the bureaucracy results in bogging down performance, and when outdated equipment create as many problems as it solves. In other words, anything that slows down the ability and the agility of the company uh, doing the work it needs to do can be lethargy. Lack of performance. There are two parts to lack of performance, perceived lack of performance and actual. So for example, if the media perceives that a company, a lack of performance by a company, in effect, the company offers nothing new or relevant to the business world, they stop covering that company. That is perceived. You ever hear the term new and improved in advertising? Well, there's a good reason for that. If customers perceive nothing new or relevant to them, they stop buying. And when that happens, perceived lack of performance can spiral into an actual lack of performance. Ask yourself, is the company delivering more excuses than products or services? Is there always a good reason that things did not turn out as planned? Is it never the company's fault? Well then, in, if those are the cases and questions that you answer yes to, then the company is experiencing lack of performance. Now, external factors. These are the outside forces, again, as the term implies, that can also show the need for a pivot. Investor turnover market changes, and customer need changes. Investor turnover, one indicator of the need to pivot is high turnover of investors. Investors typically prefer to see their investment in a company all the way through to the next stage. So if you've got startup money, they want to see it through until you're more stable. Um, if they begin to jump ship midstream, well, it may point to a deep-rooted problem within the company that will have to be addressed. Market changes. Many entrepreneurs would really like to think that the market has nothing to do with their business. However, the truth is, is the market is what is business. And what's driving the market right now? Yeah, COVID-19 and the related fears. Business slowdowns or outright work stoppages, stay at home orders, overwhelmed health systems, backlogs in the supply chain, just to name a few. The services and products that the company officer offers should respond to the market not wait for the market to fit the product. And this is where there are some real opportunities. Customer need changes. Often companies build their idea around what they think the customer should want and not what the customer in fact needs. If the company focuses on customer needs, the company builds around meeting that need as customer needs change and they will. Companies must be willing to pivot to continue to accommodate their customers. Basic number three, common pivots. There's the major competitor pivot, the product feature pivot, and the customer problem pivot. Major competitors, a direct competitor moving into the neighborhood might give you pause, but it doesn't have to mean that you have to pack it in and close up shop. Uh, by pivoting, you can capitalize on any advantages you already have, such as brand loyalty, and take the lead over the newcomer. Assess your competition and offer something that they are not. Things to consider in your pivot decision are, can you add a new feature advantage or benefit, I call those fabs, to your product or service? 
Can you change your revenue new model? How you make your money? Can you go from charging by the widget to charging by the case of widget? Uh, can you go from offering uh, one class to one student to offering a class for however many students for a fixed price? Can you tweak your technology to give you an advantage? And can you ramp up a new and unique product or service? The product feature pivot. Customers will often not only use the, uh, the products that you produce or your services the way you expect them to, but they will often use them in ways that you may never have considered. In conducting a product feature pivot, either zoom in on the features that the customers use or zoom out to add more features for the customer. Monitoring customer usage will help give direction for uh, future product development and pivoting. The customer problem pivot. Putting customers at the core of your company makes pivoting based on a customer problem easier to execute. Customer problem pivots involve a different problem for the same target customer group. This allows a company to maximize their strengths and promote it to their existing customer base. They can present their product as a solution to a problem the customer has. And for example, Starbucks began as a retailer of coffee beans and espresso makers, but then they pivoted to sell coffee already brewed. And you know the result of that. Their brand has dominated the coffee shop market and continues to gain a steady, loyal following. Next slide. Successful pivots solve a major problem. A pivot that takes the existing business and solves a new problem. Uh, business owners must be up to date on relevant issues that their customers face and be creative in developing a solution out of the processes that are already in place. Maybe use the product in a better way or apply the, apply the service to solve a different problem. It's a shift in focus, not a major overhaul. Successful pivots maintain relevance to the company identity and vision. Remember, the corporate goal along with the company's identity is unchanged by a pivot. For example, uh, there's a company called CompuTrace. Uh, that was a computer program that focused on the recovery of stolen computer devices. The company performed a pivot when they realized that the data contained on the device was far more valuable than the device itself. They developed a tool that allowed customers to uh, remove data from a stolen device remotely. Have any of you seen that on your uh, on your mobile phone, for example. That's from CompuTrace. They continue to pivot their company, but each step is still in line with their established identity of computer and technology security. Successful pivots listen to their customers. The customer-centric pivot strategies are more likely to be successful. Um, engaging in meaningful com conversations with your customers to make sure you know what they need, uh, and to develop solutions that they need and with the services that are offered and the missing links in their daily operations. You can incorporate customer-driven solutions into your pivot. Using data gathered from customers can open your company to innovative solutions and supply redirection when a pivot isn't working. Uh, remember when we talked about data, it's, it's really important that you know and understand your data. When you understand your customer needs, you're better equipped to offer solutions that work, a consistent process for customer feedback is essential to maintaining relevance and consistently improving services. Next slide. So looking at new opportunities without compromising your strategy. Um, this is pretty darn simple and it's just good common sense. Keep your eye on the market and be prepared for change because there, it is going to be there. Uh, some examples in the current economy include Anheuser-Busch. They pivoted from beer to hand sanitizer. Hand <laughs> brands. They pivoted from t-shirts and briefs to medical masks. Each one has retained their company identity, but they're just retooled what they are doing to meet the current market-driven needs. And the last piece of advice that I have for you is just really manage change, or, or it will manage you. Um, and ensure that your business has continuity. 
This requires the right mix of technology, patience, and agility. Um, and it will vary based on the company and the industry. Engage your people in developing solutions. They can and will help you. For example, a collaborative mobile workforce needs applications that encourage remote collaboration, the infrastructure that supports remote workers, and remote worker policies. So that's really all that I have on pivots. I have a couple of other examples if you care to hear them, but I'd like to leave time for a QA. Um, and I'd like I think there's so few of us on the phone that we can just kind of open it up, can we not? All right. I like manage that. Um, yes, we can. Uh, if you are attending or if you are in attendance, you can submit questions through the Q&A or um, I am happy to unmute everybody if you would prefer it that way. Um. No. Any questions anybody wants to put in the Q&A chat window? I wish all of them had their questions at the end. That'd be great. That means that the presenters did a great and thorough job, and we appreciate that. All right. That sounds like, oh, what's that? Sorry, I don't know what I'm looking at. Was that a question? Or I was going to say, let's, looks like we're letting everybody go a little bit early. I don't see anything in the Q&A. Last right. chance for, for questions if anybody wants to ask uh, Helen or Natalie a question. All right. Well, I think everybody on this call also knows how to get a hold of me. So let me know if you think of something later. And I appreciate you joining our call. Thank you. Well, thanks to the Lynch Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.